who is a um, Edward Bass Distinguished Fellow, will give a seminar. She's a paleobotanist. She's been working with um, Derek and with Peter Crane and doing some processing of, of um, some of the fossils in the museum and actually, I guess, um, um, you know, just looking into the fossil record that's available and really making some interesting new discoveries as well as helping to curate um, those fossils for, uh, and catalog the fossils for the, for the collection. So she'll have fascinating stories to tell about um, actually seeds and, and plants that they've discovered. Um, but today, um, today's speaker, Giuseppe Armatulli, is um, someone that I, I, I wanted to draw your attention to for several reasons. Um, the, one, one thing that we're trying to do here, and, and what Gibbs has done through this program here, is try to um, support some spatial data analysis, analysis of big, big spatial data, and, and actually complement this program with the Center for Earth Observation, which does also deal with big data, um, and basically link sort of the biophysical world that the CEO, the Center for Earth Observation, deals with, with more of the biotic world and the geospatial uh, patterns of, of biodiversity on this planet. Um, but in addition to that, what we're, what we're working toward now, because the library is also interested in um, GIS and curating big data, we're trying to build a community of practice in geospatial um, data analysis. And to that, in, in, in that role, Giuseppe is also sort of instrumental because he'll be one of the resource people um, that you might be able to um, access to, to help um, analyze your data or get advice on, on uh, how to go about doing that. And Giuseppe has been really um, an instrumental player all semester with the workshops. I'm sure everybody's on the list sir, for the workshops that he's been offering um, just to get people, you know, get people have to get the skills to actually do some of these geospatial analyses. Um, so he's been really an important player there. But he's also been very important in terms of just sort of the basic analysis of biodiversity patterns with Walter Jetson's research program. And so he's wearing many hats and he's he's a he's sort of a jack of all trades, but I don't know that all of us are really aware of everything that he does and offers. Um, so that's why I, you know, thought that it would be useful to hear from Giuseppe um, just to, so that you guys can get an appreciation of, of sort of an important resource that, that we have on campus um, to, to help us out. Giuseppe actually comes from, to us from a forestry program. He got his master's in forest science and dealing with, with the spatial spread of uh, forest fires, right? And, and then he went on to do a PhD in, in, in um, looking again at forest ecosystems and, and soil processes and whatnot. Um, and then he was hired here after a while to, to actually apply his technical skills that he learned as a master's and doctoral student um, for, for the various things that he's going to talk about today. So the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much for the nice introduction and everything. Um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about big data meets geo computation, combining research and productivity and projecting the digital sphere. Over here, you can already see there are four uh, mainly important uh, keywords like big data, geo computation, research and productivity, and projecting the efficiency. That I'm trying to build up a sort of framework to, to show you what we can do combining these uh, framework of words. And then I will also explain why we have this video over here in the, the first slide, and which role is playing. Um, so, uh, and in particular, I will see where we are and what we can do in this term of big data, big data processing, digital computation, many computation. Um, so, everybody knows we are entering this Anthropocene era. Every, everything is modeled by humans. We are com completely changing the landscape changing biodiversity structure, changing soil, finding backgrounds, and so on. And in fact, in the meantime, in order to drive the present, the present, they also to drive the future, we are collecting thousands of data. These thousands of data can come from mobile, satellite data, uh, satellite uh, data, GPS, recording everything that you, are, you have already known. But these sorts of data, 
need to be uh, need to be combined and be able to understand, and especially in the context of, of biodiversity and ecological application, why we need to to, uh, to know this data and be able to analyze for this. So simple research question, like, like for example, counting number of trees in a simple plot, can become really complicated and complex whenever we go at the global scale. So even, uh, let's say, research questions that have been applied in a little study case can become really complicated when we massively enlarge and scaling up the procedure. So we are trying to, to cope with this changing from uh, local scale uh, combination, local scale study, to massive study combination. So we are able, we, we need to be able to analyze uh, l large and complex data, to analyze capture, searching, recognize factoring, storage, and also transfer data. Um, so um, the second word was this new word, okay, new, walk, old, but also new in the term geocomputation. So the use of computational intensive techniques for spatial data analysis. So uh, was coming up in the 70s, but nowadays it's getting again more power because we really need we need the geo, the information are geolocated, but we need the computation that are able to deal with all these massive processes. So the, the third the, the third word was another one, processing efficiency. So what do I mean for processing efficiency? Um, so I mean Efficiency in the process, how we write a code that needs to be fast, but also how I handle my processor, even with a single code, and how to handle my processor in an order, in a, just in a normal computer, but and then be able to transfer my application in the HPC, in the high performance computer. So, for example, we'll drive up a little, little example over here. Over here, you have the CPU of my little laptop, and you have one, two, three, four, and you can see that. Uh, the, the CPU is quite stable, they are not working, and what if I want to start to create a big file, I would be able to create this big file, so I can create just a sequence of one to ten million rows, first file, second file, third file, fourth file, and then I want to create a sum up of this file. So what I see, what I can see that in my CPU are really increment very fast over here, all of them, and just in in a couple of seconds, in my laptop, I don't retrieve a sum of 10,000 million rows or four parts. So this is the computational power where we try to reach in a small computer and then transfer it to the HPC in a way of real well thinking uh, with the computational power and scientific approach behind. Then we have the, the, the fourth uh, word that is research inclusivity. So what I mean, research reproducibility that um, is uh, the capacity to be some, from somebody else to replicate what I do. Okay, this uh, has been already established quite well in the genetic field and the biotechnology field, but it's still not yet uh, accomplished in the in the world of gene computation. Um, so why? Because we need this reproducibility for for somebody else, but also for myself. I want to repl replicate every time. What they did before, and this is accomplished just if we end in, in figure and, and establish a uh, code. Uh, so, how we can combine all together this, um, this world and this uh, theory behind? We need a high performance computer and be able to work with my laptop and transfer data and also idea from the laptop to the HPC. But I also need to import some software like open source software that are able to handle massive data, they are easy to communicate, and so on. So, in this context, I should come up um, with the two important questions in the term are we ready to intensive to high performance computer in the gen computation, especially? And are we ready to teach and transfer our knowledge to the Yale community, also, also outside to the Yale community as a uh, stand up location for this kind of uh, uh, application. Um, in particular, which role is playing open source software? So uh, we can go deep into understanding which kind of rail, uh, which, which kind of play is rolling, um, and why we use it. 
First of all, because we need to achieve scientific, uh, scientific question, we need to reply scientific question, but we need also to be able to handle in techniques, the techniques to handle this scientific data. And in particular, what I need, I, I need codes that need to be easy to publish, that I can take from somebody else, open, understand what they do, change something, improve it, and report it again to the web. So this allowed me to learn it from somebody, but also build up my knowledge in how, how to change the code and apply new scientific techniques. So, and then I, I the second point that is uh, allowed is something very important, complex workflow. So it be able to integrate different data analysis in a in a whole platform, in, in the same platform and going from from where? From getting the data, different kinds of data directly from the internet or from my instrument, image, climate, biodiversity, economics, and this usually can be really big, you already know. So what I need to do, I need to uh, get gathering, cleaning, filtering, harmonizing, and usually this is the most uh, intense in terms of, of, of data deduction. I really call it this one, this part of the here, summarizing, or like squeezing your data as, of, uh, as much as possible before to work, before to import the statistical, stati for statistical analysis and also for physical modeling. So all this part, all together, the handing up with what? With a different uh, graphic table <coughs> that I can summarize my, uh, my result, uh, web presentation, article, manuscript, uh, and support of images of okay. It's something that is linking back to the research reproducibility. What I have to do? I have to be able to run this process several times myself, but also somebody else. Okay? So in order to do in order to do this, uh, what we need? We need we need to maximize the software interoperability between all the different steps, okay? And we need to have a, a stable operating system. And when I say open, a stable operating system, that can be my laptop, but can be also inside of the HPC. Um, HPC stands for High Performance Computing. So here at Yale, um, we have a really nice infrastructure in high performance computers. So, um, so far, uh, so far, I mean, before my arrival, the computer was mainly using, the, the high performance computer was mainly using for molecular mechanics, material science, biochemistry, so with the different software to understand the pattern in the gene and the pattern in the different molecules and so on. And it was based on a really stable Linux operating system, uh, but you know, many people, they were doing a lot of geo-computation in terms of geographical data analysis, okay? So I start to, in cooperation uh, with Steve, that I saw here, yeah, Steve, I, I start to request this software, which I need this kind of software, how we can build it up. So, and then after um, several emails and several months of working, we come up with, a, uh, with the installation of a full, full package of software that can, can be used. And we have image, um, image processing software, really for remote and sensing environment, and the GRASS and GIS for um, uh, GRASS and GIS for GIS analysis and hydrological modeling and so on, and all the package, the R package for the GIS analysis. All this software, they have, uh, they have two things in common. They are open source, and they are able to talk, actually, to the same uh, They are able to talk together, and uh, they are common line driven. So, uh, in order to be able to, to use it, we need to learn how to use this command line, and what we can do it. So uh, what we can do it with this software? Can we do something cool and nice? So I start to, to come up with several ideas and uh, keep in touch, and, uh, sorry, and of course my Linux become a geo Linux full of power in geo computation. Um, so I, I start to, um, to take over some project and personal leading and some other that are, are coming from, from postdoc and colleagues, so in particular, the first two, uh, they are coming from two colleagues, and the other three are mainly uh, leading by myself with some, um, with some cooperation with different colleagues. So I will go one by one, explaining the main topics and why we need, and if you can already think about some application that you can do with this data, because even 
if sometimes you can see that are specific to one sector, but the techniques that is behind can be applied to several in several ways and to several other things. So I would go to the to the freshwater spe specific environmental variable, a work that has been published already in scientific data, we will see in the details. So Sami almost one year ago came with a really simple question. Can we, can we estimate environmental variable in rivers, lakes across North America? I was kind of, I was sort of say, okay, what do you need? Simple question for you, but let me explain what that means. What, what do you need? So he said, like, let's let's think about temperature. I want to estimate the water temperature in the river, try and understand the, sp the spatial biodiversity distribution in the river. And they say, okay, but so far, how they do it, how they did it? Okay, they did it for a little study case, for multiple sites, um, <coughs> so there is not a pattern for all over the world, and then we can do something for North America. And um, we can do something for North America. I say, okay, let's go deep in the explanation of why you need this kind of application. So he mentioned to me about the traditional method is just to take the, the information about the landscape. So like temperature for the air, for example, and then apply to the, the river model, the, 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 apply the, the modeling technique for the river pattern and distribution for the for the species distribution using the full variable. But the new way of calculating it to take into account the water variables, so the, the situation of the water inside the river. So uh, uh, like for example, estimating the water temperature. So in the meantime, um, I was already thinking, okay, we go from a spatial, from a completely three-dimensional, two-dimensional situation to a river network situation. So, so we need to combine inside all this information inside the river. And indeed, why? Because the, the situation in one specific point inside of the river, everybody knows, is, is driven by the basin on top of the river, and so on, and so on. So what we need, we need a sort of computation that is able to carry over the information that is driven by the basin on the top and carry over along the river. So sort of something like this. We have a basin, we have a single river, we can calculate the basin for each single cell, and this information is driven inside to the, to the cell. So mathematically, conceptually, it's very easy to implement for a little study area, but when we scale it up, we are facing with all the problem with the in the computational level. And then what we did, we, we do for each single um, for each single basin. We just calculate the average of precipitation inside the basin and we put inside and we ag aggregate in a single cell. And the same we do it for the amount of forest that is driven inside the forest to the to the water in order to have the, the different kind of situation in, in the water and we also have the crop, so how the crop influence and all with the, all the chemistry behind. So we can create a surrogate variable that are able to estimate what was happening on top of our situation and so on. So um, in that moment, I was already thinking to combine different command in grass and come up and say, yes, this one can be done with grass. And we can do it not, all, not only for North America, we can also do it for the globe. Are you sure people are working for five years in this context? Yeah, yeah, we can do it. I, I have done best, and we can do it, don't worry. So I come up, and um, one, in two weeks I draft, I draft the code, and this code was able to do what? To, to consider the watershed of all, all over the world, one kilometer resolution, so like, like this one, compute the computation for each cell and so on, and include already all the topographic variables, uh, climate variable, land cover, inside this stream network. And we extend also to river uh, lakes and reservoir, and we come up uh, with a computation of, of more than 20 billion, uh, more than 20 billion uh, cells. We feed up everything in the, in the HPC, we even get a call from somebody for HPC that we were running out of resources, and we were stacking on everything, so we, we try to implement a better code, and we come up with an overview of the, of the full computation. This part is missing because the hydro, hydro shed is stopping here on the northern part at 60 degrees, 
And we come up with all the different environmental layers, river environmental layers, like the surface geology, the upstream seed, soil, the different kind of matrix for precipitation, uh, elevation range, and temperature, the upstream temperature range, and so on. So a clear pattern can be really linked back with this picture. So that is, is identified, for example, the information about the cultural area inside, almost inside the river. So you can already see the spot, the pattern. Red lines over here in the Middle West with all the corn and soya beans are planted. And if you zoom in, you can see that still the red part over here. Okay, but you can already see that there is less information of agriculture inside the river. Okay. So you zoom up again here, and you can see the typical pattern, the red high concentration of agriculture inside the, inside the river, and the blue and white is coming from the forest. You can also, also notice, a bit, not really white, but over here, for example, there is a, a river that is blue, right? because it's coming from the back part, from a big basin that is from a forest area. Indeed, it's completely do more, more here, we can see more in detail, it's this blue line that is coming from the forest area. So and completely the opposite, if we think about, we have for forestry, we have completely the inverse pattern where we have. So and we did this one for different variables, we come up with a long list, uh, annual precipitation that is important also for the runoff, and, and then we knew, uh, Sammy was able to model the species distribution with a better accuracy and coming back to the to the better accuracy over here. Yeah, this one over here. So this one is coming from this kind of computation. So you can already see the difference between the accuracy between the two and you can already notice the improvement of this kind of computation. So these are also important, uh, not only the kind of driven that we did, we did this, uh, uh, this computation for species distribution, but you can think that the same technique can be applied for different kind of uh, study the runoff of, uh, of the river, you can study the erosion because uh, the erosion is influenced by the slope and, and the, the so kind, of side, kind of soil on top of the river. So you can do a lot of application. And we are also think, uh, working with some other colleagues in order to try to understand and estimate the phosphorus and nitrogen inside the water due to the uh, pollution coming from the upstream for the agricultural area and so on. And we go also in, uh, in the estimation of some ecological river ecological classes. So this is a point of work. So we leave the, the stream and, okay, no, the scientific, uh, we publish this work in the scientific data. Um, this is a journal that is published the data, so it was fitting very well uh, to us. And something very really important to come back in the research, the research reproducibility, we also release the code. This is something very important because you, you show what you did, but it's also clever. You get the citation for the paper, you get the citation for the data, you get the citation also for who is using the code. So it's also a clever way to do it. And don't think that somebody can be fast in get the code and do something else, because it's quite complex code, so you need to learn a, a lot how to do it. So <laughs> we are more than once when you release the code, you understand it behind what this thing is, is there. So, and, and then we go, we left this the sector, we go a bit in the urban structure, uh, urban structure and uh, accessibility versus travel. <coughs> um, so, Kelly um, or Eleanor Stoke, PhD candidate date for the forest uh, department asked me, can we model the urban spatial structure in its relation to current demand? Okay, okay, let me understand what, what you mean for spatial, <laughs> urban spatial structure. I need, I need to, to see what is behind the work. Um, um, so I, I want to do for a few study, uh, for a few regions, uh, for a few uh, city, and I say, okay, if we do something, let's, let, let's be able to scale it up already and thinking about do it for all the all United States. So, uh, in terms of urban structure, you can already understand that, that the population density, the building density, is driven in the different shape of the city, okay? So we have a city, city more compact, city a bit more flat, and so on. Probably in, you know, in Europe, we are, we are more in this form, 
in the United States is more spreading, especially in the upper in the suburban area. And this shaping is influencing where the people live and where the people go to job to work. So it's influencing the entropy mobility and how the people move inside to each location going from the uh, job location to the household. So we need to study this movement and see how this is linked with the, uh, with the relationship with the crowd. So also for this, we uh, come up with, okay, we, we need to use GIS implementation. We can have a community starting point uh, coming from the population density. We can use the community <coughs> ending point as the job, uh, job location density. And then what we need, we need a sort of friction surface. So how much time each person need to, to travel and go from here to here. So we need to study the situation for each cell in the, in the population density to each cell in the commuting ending point, because one person can go in different way. So this is coming up really, uh, uh, really obvious in terms of iteration. We do an iteration for each end cell creating an accumulative cost surface, so cost surface nothing else like a digital evolution model, so something that, and, uh, that is going all over the surface, and we use the using cost part analysis, so we follow which one of the, is the most easy route for each single cell. So we compute this computation for each single cell, we create a cumulative cost map, we attribute to the value of the cell. So we come up, this one also has been done in grass, we come up with this accessibility map for each region. So you can see already this central where you have high density roads, where you have high uh, people and main job inside there is higher accessible rather than suburban area is less accessible. So if a person needs to go from here to here, probably require more time than here from here to here. So this is the concept. So now she's trying, she's trying to link this one with what with the with the travel demand but again the travel demand so we, we did this with all the different uh, city for the for the United States so each one is a city and we can see the different pattern and so on so some are really usually it's always centric the situation but the the, the the fastness of going out is quite can change from city to city so um, in order to study this situation, uh, we need to understand how the people move in terms of accessibility, where are the roads, and where is the population density. So we need to combine these three, three information all together, and it's becoming like a single layer. Say, okay, we can do a supervised, unsupervised classification with the KME cluster analysis, and come up with a sort of classification map that takes into account the three, um, the three information. It's really remote sensing oriented approach that can be applied in a city structure. So you can see already that each one represents a class of each one. So we can have each single axis over here, and each one of the axes can be the map. Okay? So we can identify classes that have high population density, high accessibility, and high road density. So we come up with a several maps and each one for each city and you can already you can already see from the color that the different the distribution of the classes is different and also some main main classes are more present than the other one uh, and also how they are spatially related so now she's trying to link this one now Kelly she's linking this one with the class distribution and trying to understand their, their relation to the travel demand so this study has been done uh, several times already, but just for three, four, three, four city using uh, uh, using already this, uh, method already started in GIS, but has never been expanded in a so big framework okay, again. So uh, we are really thinking to, to go at global level if we are able to find job presence, for example. So sometimes also they is driven by the presence of data. Uh, in, especially in developing countries, this situation, but we will try to come up with alternative solution to solution to create, for example, job location. So, um, so this is was the, the, the poor GIS work that has been done with Kerry, and now we we go to another subject: topography and complexity layers. 
is a worker that has been living by himself in combination with a um, driven, I would say, one of the most important of value. When you do want to do something, you put the topography to something is coming around. It's driven the temperature, it's driven the, the runoff and accumulation of the water, it's driven the, the erosion of the water, it's driven also the microclimate, so present of cloud or not present of cloud. And as you can see, each one of these has a different shape. So we need to really study the different geomorphology uh, as a form, uh, uh, formology as a form in the, in the shape to try to understand and mapping uh, how it's different from one place to another place. Um, so the USGS um, uh, USGS uh, release a quite well well good established uh, digital elevation model uh, with the different uh, different resolution going from 250 until one kilometer. And this uh, GM tag very used all over the world is uh, is based on the SRTM, another kind of uh, another. Uh, sensor, uh, but the uh, 30, uh, 90 meter resolution, but this one is stopping at 90 degrees. So he combined, they combine the <coughs> data set coming from different sources in order to have a really well established digital elevation model that can, can, can everybody can use. So from this ele elevation model, we can driven different, we can get the different matrix using a moving window surface. So, for example, for matrix or surface derivative, I can calculate the slope, aspect, different kind of curvature, inclination, and so on. And each single value inside the moving window will be driven from the position of the other pixel. Also, this one quite established technique in, uh, in, in GIS. We can do it, this one, in, the, in graphs, that we can, we can code in everything, we can tie it up, how it works in tiles, and we can process each single uh, each single tile, each single part of the globe inside to the inside to each single node. Um, so then, when we have this one done at 150, we can aggregate the one kilometer, the five kilometer, ten kilometer, and for each one we can get the mean, the maximum, the standard deviation, the typical matrix. And this one can be done really fast with the PK tools implemented in C++. So the combination of these two software it can give me the full power to process all the data. And so what we can do, what we can take it out from this. So we can come out why we need to do this. Because the, uh, the topography, the digital elevation model, and each single pixel changing its relation between the, 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 different, uh, the different, and they can be established about uh, concerning the inclination, but uh, actually about giving information about the roughness. So if the, the surface is flat, it's very high roughness or not. So we can calculate the different topographic position index or terrain roughness index based on the position of the object. Consider different matrix like <coughs> divided by the standard deviation or the mean uh, minus and the minimum maximum and so on. We come up with different uh, indexes that give to us the roughness. Uh, another important aspect is not only the position, but also the position, the curvature of the digital elevation in the tangent, in the, in the, in the two profiles. So the, 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 the profile curvature, convex or concave, and so on. So we can really study the, the morphology and how they are distributed all over the surface. And we can already identify the area of concavity, convexity, and really important for erosion, and so on. So this one can be, um, so an example, yes, an example of, for example, the different kind of um, roughness and roughness index. So you can see each one has a, a mean and a standard deviation. So you can see that each one changing the topographic index, they are applied differently, the color, how they are related. So someone may put in consideration more if they are steep, steep or not. So they are changing a lot. As you can see also the profile has changing and how the different, um, more or less, you can identify some sort of pattern always, of course, mountain areas are always more rough than others, but the different indexes identify different level of roughness that are important for these different studies. So, in the term of roughness, uh, we can go also to see the profile curvature. So, the profile curvature, we can get, uh, we can have the profile curvature along uh, we, we can have the profile curvature 
along this axis and the tangential curvature along uh, along the vertical axis. So you can have concavity and convexity in the two situations. And also here you can derive different kind of curvature, first order, partial derivative, second order, and so on, you get the median, standard deviation, and so on. So you can already establish a really big amount of variables that are really try to identify uh, the different uh, position among them. The combination of the two gives to us the ability to identify the geomorphic landfall. So if a situation is completely flat, if they are peaky, peak, ridge or spurs, it's completely flat, good slope, and so on. And this can be then applied in combining the different uh, combining the different uh, topography layer, and we can identify the area, this is the percentage over here, we can identify the percentage of each class inside to the, uh, uh, the group. So you can really use this map to later on to model something else based on the geomorphological landforms. And we can also derive, we can also derive some some other index from the landform, uh, majority, like the majority of the geomorphic landform, so the class more present, uh, different kind of index like the Shannon index and the entropy homogeneity index, it tends to help for money. So we can really understand all, all the different classes, how they are related. Um, so we have a really big amount of we have a really big amount of variable that now they can be used into different kind of application going from soil analysis species distribution analysis erosion and, and so on so we, we are able to build up a next step further with a different kind of model so we leave the the, con the context of um, of the topography, we go in another subject over here, in land surface temperature and climatology. This is a, a work that uh, I'm leading, I'm leading, and I will show almost, yeah, I would say almost our final result, in particular, uh, why we need this information. Okay, land surface temperature is um, is not the temperature of the air, but it's the temperature of the surface. <coughs> so we are touching the soil, for example, or we are touching the, the forest. And are, are extremely important because are driven, are then driven the temperature and so of the air and so on. And um, we have two important satellites that are passing continuously to the to the to the sky. That taking two pictures, one in the morning and one uh, in the afternoon. Aqua and Terra, and these are getting information about the spectral signal of, of the surface. But then we can retrieve with the model the land surface temperature and the sea. Uh, so we can, these are the two, we, we can use the two, the two sensors to really understand how change in time the temperature. Um, but you can start, you can already see there are two main problems. One, the presence of cloud, so we can also detect uh, under the cloud. And also, uh, the, the land surface temperature is strongly related to the land use. Um, so we cannot do it any kind of spatial interpolation because we cannot mix the information of close by pixel that is, is green, maybe with a base soil. So we need to go in the temporal domain in order to be able to, to do some sort, sort of kind of um, interpolation. Interpolation for what? Because we have this situation where we have a single cloud, for example, that is completely blocked is completely blocked information coming from the satellite. So we have a completely missing of situation. So if we have a temporal domain of temperature, for example, going from one to 365, and each one of the little spot is every eight day image, we are missing something. As I mentioned, we cannot interpolate the situation, the spatial domain, because it's not mix up with the land use, but we can interpolate from the time. And I was fixing I uh, was thinking to use the different kind of spline techniques like a team up could be to be able to interpolate and having interpolate and having a prediction along this time. And something even more important, I can also use the same kind of interpolation to predict a specific day in the year. Okay? So this is allowed to us to have a full climatology. If I calculate each single day, I will have 365 days, completely covered, smooth, and so on. So 
this allowed to to future analysis in the implementation of language uh, of language structure. So if we see in details, if we see in details in this animation, we can see that all the gap filling or the cloud are gone. Okay, we don't see any more gap in the cloud. You can see that all the surface is completely covered, and you can see the typical pattern of temperature going from the situation of high temperature in the desert to the northern part and so on. So we can really use this data. So for doing this, I, I really managed to, to accomplish with, working with all the full archive of MODIS, 12 years for the full, uh, full domain in the different, um, for each single day. And we come up with the four map, one for each satellite, one for the afternoon, and one for uh, the model. This map can be used for species distribution modeling, but can be used also in urban heatlands, for example, to try to understand how the, the, the urban is more warm than outside the Mediterranean area, and how we are going to, to, to focus in the spatial factor in order to change the, eventually the urban life. But it's not so everything so beautiful, because there are always problems behind, uh, the MODIS, uh, the MODIS uh, product, for example, you can already understand that this, this one is not a typical pattern that can be established in the, in the normal situation, so due to do some preprocessing. Indeed, doing the, the temporal spline, you can identify some auto layer that is in infrared cloud detection. They also call it uh, cloud contaminated pixel, because in this case, over here, Temperature is not the temperature of the surface, but it's the temperature of the temperature. <coughs> so now yeah, I'm going to try to, to solve this situation, implementing a statistical light filter that should be able to, to, cook, uh, to cope with the different spikes that are produced by this one, and try to come up with a better, uh, with a better work. So now we are in phasing of phasing to solve this solution. Anyway, the, the product is really close to uh, to be had and can be already used it because it's just concentrating this part close to India, Himalaya region. That's the problem. I was already in touch. I was in touch with the, with the, uh, with the scientists behind to admit that there are problems. So it is also working in that direction. Let's see if we come up with something more uh, reliable. So last um, last example, and I put as a last one, not because it's the most is the Nice support, but actually the most important one. And I really like this subject, monthly moon solar radiation. Uh, so I'm trying to detect, uh, uh, try to estimate the solar radiation that is coming to the Earth in terms of monthly moon. Okay, so over here, I'm trying to simplify as much as possible a complex phenomena that is happening. Uh, so we have, we, everybody knows, we have the sun over here that is transmitting a certain amount of energy. This energy is completely is constant, and then we have directly the atmosphere that is absorbing a part of the energy. This part of the energy that is passing through the atmosphere is arriving directly to us as a direct solar radiation, like today, or it's completely scattered inside the atmosphere, and we call about diffuse insulation, diffuse radiation. What was happening, for example, yesterday with the cloud formation? So, indeed. We talk about clear sky radiation, and everything is completely clear. We don't have clouds, we don't have aerosol, or at least we have just a minimum amount of aerosol, and for aerosol, I identify, they identify as a viper, little particle, pollution, so it's a bunch of um, molecules inside. So we can have, but the situation is not this one. This, the situation is considering the real sky condition, is considering the clouds, Okay, it's considered the cloud that is stopping the direct radiation, but also the scattered one of the aerosol is also influencing the diffuse radiation. This part of the direct radiation is covering almost 80% of the incoming. So if we are able to model this one, we already establish a good potential of estimation of uh, direct radiation. So why we need this information? Because the, okay, the sun is driving everything. We can use the, the map for for photovoltaic panel, for biodiversity estimation, for grow plant modeling, for forest plant modeling, for a lot of information. So if we focus 
in this one, that is the one that I was working with mainly, uh, the traditional method, what is doing? It's doing something, uh, something quite, quite simple, so it's getting the observation, uh, direct radiation from the different stations that are all over the globe, there are quite a lot, we'll see another picture afterwards, and it's, it's making just a coefficient between the, the direct radiation from the station and the direct radiation in the clear sky, so modeled without one. This coefficient for each single station, okay, is then modeled in a thread surface, and this one becoming our my thread surface that then is applied to the clear sky condition. But as I mentioned before, this situation is nothing else, or at least is driven by what? By the presence of cloud. So we can use a product that has been uh, done by Adam Wilson and the Jet Lab that has been uh, submitted that they represent the number of days, the cloudy day numbers for each single month. So each single pixel represents the percentage of data that is cloud in one month. So this one is useful to detect the coefficient of filtering the incoming solar radiation. So I, I, I try to propose this method and uh, think about and say, okay, let's come up with, uh, with uh, let's see if it's worth it. So I collect all the different uh, information about solar radiation lab around the world, and uh, there are different databases over here. Each one is a different database, and I pull it out, clean it up, and so on, and then I plot it in a really difficult situation, observation versus my prediction, okay? This is in, in, clear, in clear sky condition. So now this equation needs to be calibrated with my information about the cloud, so, and I hope that my scattering, my wide uh, scattering situation become more uh, more close to the one-to-one -one observation and actually more close in terms of shape. So I reduce quite a lot the root mean square error arrived to 0 0.8. So now there is still some uh, mis light, uh, mis alignment between the one-to-one -one line and this one, but that one can be corrected afterward with calculating the coefficient over here. So, and I implementing everything for the full flow and we come, I come up with this really nice animation that I think is given very well uh, what is going on. So we have over here the clear sky condition, so no cloud, and we can see the typical pattern of the la 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 uh, la la longitudinal oscillation of the sun, and we can also see over here the situation when I, I introduce the cloud. So we can see the information about uh, the, how it changes the situation in the tropics and so on, and so on. So this one is, um, is as I mentioned, is, uh, is driven the eight, almost 80% of the, of the radiation. Uh, so now I'm trying to also model the, the diffuse radiation and I'm already encountering some problems. So we'll see how it is going to be developed. But I think this one is, is, is a nice, uh, it's a nice layers. Uh, this one, of course, uh, I think is done for each single month. But again, we can, when you identify the coefficient for each month, you can then extrapolate and make a spline inside the coefficient of each month and apply a full seasonality climatology, solar climatology situation all over the year or over the world. Um, and of course, the unit is like back for meter squared per day, so how much amount is arriving in each meter squared for each day. Uh, this one can be crossover with the other kind of uh, model that already exists, but usually uh, all the models that already exist in uh, solar radiation modeling, they're, they're working mainly with the transfer model and they're working 0 0.25, uh, 0 0.25 degree or 0 0.5 degree, and rather here is one kilometer pixel. And as you can see, you can see already that take into account, they take into account the elevation over here in Himalaya, Region, and then, or also get more evident in the art. And then this situation is carried over in the second part when we carry over the art. So for us, that we are studying situation really uh, side dependent. This took into account the digital elevation model and how it is, uh, it, uh, it is proposed in the north and south direction is quite important to, to use it for other kind of computation and stuff. So we come up 
uh, in the beginning, I start with some initial, uh, some initial question. Like, are we really intensively used uh, HPC for geocomputation? I would say after, uh, after the, what we did, yes, we have our Joe Penguin in the middle, we can, comp we can have all the different layers, geographical uh, topography and solar radiation and river, and we can integrate inside, for example, map of life. We are going to release all these, uh, some of them are already here. We are going to release uh, inside of this uh, Earth environment the different layers that they can be downloaded and use it for other kind of, uh, of, other kind of application. And the second question that I was driven, I was asking, are we ready to teach and transfer our knowledge? Our knowledge? So uh, thanks to the Spatial Research and Science and Conservation Program, I was setting up last year the first workshop in geocomputation in cooperation with the HPC folks and also with the with the Steve, I maintain all the code and teaching information in the spatial ecology internet site that I personally maintain and update. And but this workshop, why we are doing it and why is important to do this workshop? Because we need really need to learn encoding. Encoding is not is not see as a, just a, as a technical aspect. It's really not the practical problem solving skills, okay? Inspired, inspired the new research approach, promoted critical thinking, you are thinking what to do, you're just not clicking a button, you test a new idea on the fly, and, and then with the experience, if somebody tells you, can we do this? Immediately you can really understand, yes, it's feasible, can be done or cannot be done. So even before sometimes they even finish the goal. So, after with experience, you really learning how to treat the data, how to understand the distribution of the data, and so it's not only a technical aspect; it's becoming a technical aspect how to achieve your scientific uh, achievement. So, and now come to the second question. Okay, coding, but how much language you need to learn? It's like foreign language. More you are, more you know, better it is. And I would say not focusing only one and learning one 100 percent, but maybe better to focus in three or four of them and try to combine all of them inside to the operating system using Bash as a main one, uh, programming language or Python as a main programming language. But it's really important to be able to combine all all this all this power. Indeed, we set up a workshop where we use uh, where we use Linux virtual machine, um, we focus in common line syntax rather than graphical user interface. Uh, we promote the self-learning, we promote to read the, the manual and to search for it in the internet. We show different applications in forestry, land use, uh, and we support the we support the, the student coding uh, during the office hour and also during the, the workshop. So workshop that has been driven almost all over the world by myself and also when I come over here with, uh, with, uh, with Gisela Kakorin, we went to Kenya and also Larry and we, we teach students uh, and we were using perfectly the same techniques that I was using in HPC, just computer from even seven years old. We give to them several RAM and they upgrading, we were working the night to upgrade all the computer and these they were more lucky people because they were in, in a, and not developing countries, so that we will go a bit faster and build a better computer. We did a course, I organized a course in the south of Italy and also in, uh, in uh, Santa Barbara University. Um, <clears throat> so with all these uh, package of uh, scientific aspects also, we come up with, uh, I come up with two main, four main point, point for conclusion. Uh, simple research question can be become really complex when achieved uh, uh, in a special context, big special context, this is something that we need to achieve really uh, intensely. We need to use open source software because we need to understand the code and modify and see what we can do it in the time of geo computation in normal PC HPC. Uh, we need to achieve the reproducibility research that, as I mentioned, in genetics is quite ongoing on, but in geo computation is still a bit back backside. And coding is, is an important uh, is an important topic, also in environmental science. So I, I would suggest in two main uh, in this context. The last one we suggest one suggestion for the graduate student is a long procedure start as much as possible, start as soon as possible. And for the PI, try to incentivate your 
a graduate student to learn in coding and apply, of course, the coding to the science that is behind and, and so on. So I would like to, to finish this presentation. Thanks to all the people that have been working with me, all the developers from Europe that are developing the code and testing, find bugs, changing, and so on. All the different people from, uh, from the Jets Lab, but also that are uh, at Yale over here and uh, that are being cooperating. So I uh, leave this few minutes more for questions and so on, and uh, I hope that we will find a way of working in, in cooperation, and also the, the different layers can be used and just ask. Questions? <laughs> so the, the, the orbit study is very fascinating. And I'm wondering whether you can develop a, a, a model that allows prediction of uh, congestion, road congestion, yeah. in commuters two hours of lead time. Um, but uh, that one is the daily stuff. So, sorry? That one is the daily stuff. Congestion type stuff. Yeah, yeah. Is, is, it, is it possible? Is it too, too random? Too, too stochastic? Yeah. It's such a thing possible with the kind of structure, the kind of data that we have. Yes, probably, yes, because that one is stationary. I mean, what I saw is the location of job, the location of house, right. so they have not changed. Right. But that one, the congestion is a more time-driven, dynamic, right? it's dynamic, it's yeah. time-driven. So probably we need, maybe, but okay, Google is already in that direction with the information about... But uh, Google is more real-time, right? Give you real-time. Real time. If you can give us like two hours ahead of the time. Ah, right? okay. <laughs> but it's not instead of a map of flight, a map of traffic, then. So, <laughs> but you can do it, I mean, they do it. Stochastic, stochastic forecasting for the stock market. So probably, you, if you look at the past, you can already define the push. So, okay, the accident maybe you cannot. Yeah, that's a random right, right. But yeah. <laughs> if you if you know the football event, you know. <laughs> can you expand a little on this issue of reproducibility? It seems to me if you've got data, you've got a code. Why, you you, why would you always have the same answer? No, if you, if you have the data, you have the code, you can have the, the same answer. But the problem is, if you don't have the code, and you are trying to do the code reading the article, it's not going to come the same. So that one is the reproducible research. The free data and free code. So it's about access, really. Access, access, the, access the free data, but access the code that is behind that. Because if not, you didn't think you can understand the, the general idea, but you cannot understand each step from just from the article. Yeah. So I can take your code and put my data and get comparable results. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, please. A lot of the applications you described here were uh, using like analyses of stationary units of space through time. Um, do you, in any of your workshops or in any of your projects, look at, for instance, uh, patterns of movement? Yeah. Uh, so, like movement ecology or anything like that? I'm just curious because that's something I work on. Uh, we, for, for example, I was spoken actually with, uh, uh, with Francesca from the two, two weeks ago. She yeah. spoke to Peter. And they are going, uh, so probably she, she's going to use, it, for example, all the topographic roughness because that one are able to answer the yeah. the daily move, but also migration movement. Oh, okay, not for birds, but okay, also for people probably. So they are going to use it that stuff. But anyway, the techniques that I implemented can be used in different kind of aspects. I mean, then is behind. I, I try to, to do stuff that are more linked to my background, forestry and environmental science, but then it can be applied to the social science. But, but yeah. see, the problem right now, I mean, you can use resource selection theory or set selection theory to look at the movement, but it's the resolution yeah. of the geospatial environmental <coughs> characteristics that are hindering, because you can get really you know, 30 meter steps um, from satellites even, but you know, to describe the landscape that way, that's the real trick. And, and then to get the accuracy, that's, that's really where the challenge is. Yeah. Um, why it's very bland and stuff, what about sweet? We are working, huh? Where is Jen? We will do something. 
So uh, I'll, I'll just it, it would be it would be super roughness yeah. for the for the software part. You can use the same code. Yeah, no problem. Do you think there'll be much interaction as well? I mean, I'll, can you predict the surface temperature based on code you put out as well, or they, like, they can really interact quite quite the mess. They they have I, I they have a protocol not long surface temperature but C surface yeah. temperature. Well, they have to be as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know how much. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you think you could incorporate that into your land model as well? Like, do you think there is, that should have quite an impact? Or, like, looking at, say, wind dynamics and things like that? Um, yeah, okay. If you go in the direction of the normal situation model and try to model everything, yeah, you need land surface, but also the ocean surface. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. a quick question. Yes. The, uh, on that, on that point, there are a lot of standard data sets out there that don't from government agencies, and that everybody can access them. Are you proposing a kind of secondary data set that individuals would produce for their own research? I guess that part, but then a secondary archive where other people could go to look at these more highly processed. What, what's yes. the hierarchy of, of yes, data sets? Yes, actually, over your, here, if you're suggesting that. yeah, over here. I mentioned from the key and this internet side. Uh, I mean, everyone now what is doing, everyone is trying to that is working as study area is, is getting the dam and then is building up the aspects and growth and so on and so on. So we try to to do everything in advance uh, for for the community and in a well standardized way that if somebody is working with calculate the slope in one area, it's, it's the perfect the same algorithm that in other areas. So we are we are given a bunch of other stuff, but not these are not already present in the uh, in the archive. So all the different topography surface, the land surface temperature archive for the years in terms of climatology, the river network, the river environment of Arego was not done at all. So in this context we are quite pioneering in delivering data that can be go one step further. We are going to use also this data, but somebody else will so, I mean, I, th I think what's useful here is standardizing, Everything, uh, yeah. you know, standardizing this map and the scale here, because you can go to the government databases, and, you know, if you're, you know, the states, for example, in my field, gap analysis to find out what species are available and where they are, each state, even though it was a federal coordinated program, each state measured things in different spatial scales and extents and, and use different indices and everything so you've got to spend most of your time cleaning the data so that you can actually mesh a boundary and say okay California and Oregon you know we got a good map now and that so just because the data are available doesn't mean necessarily that you can just sort of quickly analyze it so I think that's really the huge value yeah. added of this. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, just one quick comment and then a question. Um, you mentioned open source. Another word for open source is free. So you know, these tools are great in that they'll run in Linux, they'll run in Windows, they'll run in Macs, as opposed to the expensive ArcGIS that only runs in Windows. So you can teach somebody and leave them with that tool. Uh, the question, I was looking at that solar radiation product, and, and that's just an incredible data set. Uh, so with that, you could estimate how much energy is coming in. Then you could go over your land surface temperature yeah. and see if it's cooler than what should be coming in yeah. and perhaps vegetated areas. Yes. Or if it's hotter, would that be urban areas? Yeah. Or, or start to look at aspects of that land cover by combining those two yeah. data. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this one is going to be cooled up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, if there are some uh, solar scientists, please let me know. I need some help. <laughs> <laughs> we need to wrap it up because we're running over time. Thank you again for coming in.